Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the webinar today. My name is Shannon Holmes. I'm a medical physicist here at Standard Imaging. Um, and it's my pleasure today to be able to share with you um, some information about our scintillator detectors. Let me see if my screen's, there we go. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before I really get into it. Today's webinar is being recorded. Um, so you, if you have to step out halfway through or get interrupted by the clinical duties that we know interrupt your day, um, we'll, we'll send you a link to the recording. Um, so you can look at that again later. If you have questions throughout the webinar, um, please feel free to enter them at any time into the uh, GoToMeeting dialog box. Um, I will circle around and address those at the end of the presentation. Um, it's a little bit difficult to monitor that uh, throughout the presentation, but we will certainly circle around to those at the end. <clears throat> Oops, so for those who aren't as familiar with us, um, Standard Imaging is a small uh, company that's based in Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, we've been in business since 1989, so we actually celebrated our 30-year anniversary last year. Um, we're proud to have, uh, have been able to provide um, quality QA equipment um, across the globe um, for the last 30 years. So we do design and manufacture here on site a full suite of QA products. Um, to help you ensure that your patients are really getting the highest treatment um, that they possibly can, um, of course, to the best of all of our abilities. Um, this is a picture of our facility here, but of course, out the window right now, it looks a little bit more like that. So without further ado, why scintillators? I get that question a lot when we first talk about them. Why would you use a scintillator? And the main reason, uh, motivating factor, is that these are water equivalent for MV photons and for electrons. Um, so the real advantage of this, particularly for small field dosimetry, is that you're not perturbing your beam right at the point of measurement. And so you don't have a whole list of uh, field size or energy dependent correction factors um, to apply to your measurement in order to get back to that dose to water. Um, the detectors can be made quite small. Um, they are dose and dose rate independent. We don't see energy dependence with them. Um, KQ factor from a number of publications as well as measurement is shown to be unity, which is a huge advantage um, for these really small fields. There is a tiny bit of temperature dependence. We see about a tenth of a percent per degree. Um, this really doesn't matter if you're only doing QA measurements at room temperature. Um, if we were ever to take this to um, patient skin dose measurements or something like that, then there, there would be a temperature correction that would need to be applied. Um, but we are not FDA cleared for, um, for on patient measurements yet. So usually this doesn't, this doesn't affect your QA measurements. Um, it can, it's also uh, non-metallic, non-ferrous, so um, these fibers can be used with MR Linux. We've made some extra long fibers um, to, to keep the, the detection system outside the, um, the high MR field, uh, but it has been used with MR Linux as well. So the construction of our scintillators, we have a scintillation, organic scintillating material, um, with our W1 scintillator, which was the first generation. Um, it's a one millimeter, one millimeter diameter, three millimeter long active region. Um, with the W2, there's the one by three and an option for a one by one scintillator. These are coupled to uh, a PMMA optical transfer fiber um, that takes the light to a, an optical collection system um, and converts it into electrical signal. We do have to correct for Cherenkov light. Um, this is kind of a classic Cherenkov picture of looking into a, a reactor coolant pool. Um, but Cherenkov light, for those who aren't familiar with it, is um, light that's generated by electrons traveling faster than the speed of light in the medium. Um, so it's kind of a, a light shock wave, just like a, a sonic boom is a sound shock wave uh, from a jet traveling faster than the speed of sound. Um, and this is generated in our optical transfer fiber, so it is a field size dependent stem effect. Um, we correct for this using a two-channel chromatic correction that's based on a publication from Matthew Guyot et al. Um, we have a link to that on the website, or you can certainly go straight to MedPhysics and look that up. Um, but it's, um, it, it allows us to um, 
do a couple of characterization measurements, which I'll talk about next, um, and, and use the um, correction factor we get from those characterization measurements to remove that stem effect and get, get you back just to the scintillation signal. Um, these are not absolute dosimeters. You do have to give them a reference dose if you want to get output in terms of dose um, and periodically recalibrate them as the, the plastic accumulates dose. Um, just like your uh, PMMA phantoms, um, they do yellow. This Our optical transfer fiber will, will yellow a little bit with radiation, with age, um, and that changes how it transmits the spectrum. Um, and it attenuates the spectrum just a little bit of that uh, scintillation light. And so that's the reason for the recalibration um, as, you, um, as your fiber ages and accumulates dose. So our scintillator is a blue scintillator. Um, so we split the optical signal into a blue and a green portion of the spectrum. The blue portion here um, is primarily scintillation signal, um, but there is Cherenkov, which is broad spectrum, um, present in that blue channel. The green portion of the spectrum is primarily Cherenkov, but again, there's this tail of the scintillation detector or scintillation signal that, it, that um, also overlaps with the green channel. Um, so what we do for characterization is we have, um, with our W1, we provide this um, characterization slab. With the W2, it's a smaller bracket that can go into your water tank. Um, but you would do two sets of measurements. One we call a minimum fiber measurement, where you have the fiber coming straight out of the field. Um, the second measurement is called a maximum fiber measurement, where you wrap it around uh, the, the channel through the slab here. Um, the idea really is keep the dose to the scintillator constant, um, while changing the amount of Cherenkov that's in the field. So when this broad spectrum field um, increases, we get an increase in both of the, the uh, color channels. And based on the relative change in the green channel compared to the relative change in the blue channel, we get a correction factor that we can use for sub subsequent measurements so that based on the signal in the green channel, we can correct the blue channel for the presence of the Cherenkov light there. Um, you can do a dose calibration then. Um, the slab for the W1 shows a 10 by 10 field marked um, with the minimum fiber configuration. Give it a known dose at, uh, at a known depth um, and you can uh, then report your dose, your measurements in terms of the dose that the scintillator, should, scintillator is receiving. So the W1 scintillator, as I mentioned, is our first generation device. It has been on the market since 2014. Um, it has that one by three millimeter active area, and there are quite a few publications um, that talk about the use and the response of the W1. Um, there's a lot of that listed on our website. Um, one of the key ones recently, though, is um, the IAEA and AAPM joint publication on small field dosimetry, which is the technical report series 483. Um, shows the W1 in uh, a number of their tables, and in every single one, um, it is the only detector that across the board for every field size energy uh, um, and every energy and every um, machine that they, that they include for those tables shows a KQ value of one. Um, this was designed to be just a single point measurement system. Um, it does require a two-channel electrometer like our Supermax electrometer um, to perform that Cherenkov subtraction. You can use it with two one-channel electrometers, but the, the timing is a little more tricky, um, and uh, and you you would have to do all of that um, the corrections by hand. With the W2, um, which is our more recent development, um, it does have a user replaceable fiber on this one. Um, with the W1, the fiber is um, attached directly to the optical system, optical detection system. Um, we have options then for both a one by one and a one by three millimeter scintillator. Um, we have a dedicated optics and electronic uh, pro signal processing unit called the Max SD that will take that um, the light from the scintillator, um, convert that to an electrical signal, um, perform the Cherenkov correction, um, and then it can even um, output, convert that corrected signal back to an analog output, which it can send um, through a triax cable directly to your water tank electrometer. So your water tank sees it just as a diode, essentially, um, or just like it would see a diode, that it, it doesn't apply bias, but it gets a current when a uh, dose is being given to the detector. 
you can also do point dose measurements um, either uh, for um, output factor measurements or, or directly trying to measure point dose. Um, we've had people do it for patient-specific QA measurements for SRS treatments um, in a phantom like our Lucy phantom. Um, you can do that directly with the interface with the MaxSD. Um, a little bit of some of, of the measurement data that has been published um, about the W2. Um, I forgot to update this slide to put in the reference, but there's a, a paper from Richard Popple's group at the University of Alabama in Birmingham um, where they looked at dose measurements for stereotactic targets um, down to targets of three millimeter diameter and compared their results with film um, and got excellent agreement with the, the W2. Um, this plot is from Indra Das's group at NYU Langone. Um, they have a publication also listed on our website um, and looked at comparing the W2 with film here for uh, small field scanning. Um, they also looked at dose rate dependence and dose dependence. Um, and as we anticipated, um, it behaved the same way as the W1 has. Um, it's the same fiber. It's the same sort of uh, data processing. We did not uh, expect to see any changes there. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to step into the, the interface for the Max SD is a web-based interface. Um, and so when you first plug in that unit, um, if you co connect an Ethernet cable to it, you can either directly connect to your computer um, or you connect, can connect it into your clinic network. Um, it will display an IP address on the front. So when I go to that IP address, I get this home screen. It shows me raw values that are being measured right now. And this is just background noise. I don't have radiation here that I can show you uh, measurements. Um, if you've got um, this Cherenkov light ratio is the, the correction factor that we get from those characterization measurements. It will show you which, um, which of those saved files is being applied. Um, and it will show you then, because we have a dose calibration, it will show you output in terms of uh, dose. You have a library that shows you um, all of the, the CLR uh, files that have been saved, um, but you would create those in our CLR wizard here. It walks you through your maximum fiber setup. Um, if I, I can either do trigger or timed or, um, or manual collections. We'll just do a two second uh, background collection. Um, and it will show you your results here. It'll also calculate averages and standard deviations, um, set up your minimum fiber configuration, and we do the same thing here. You can take multiple measurements um, until you're, you're happy with the averages. Delete them if you've made something in error. Um, if you want to do a dose calibration, it will walk you through that as well. You can enable it. You can say, I want to give it 100 centigrade. Um, and then uh, use trigger levels to, to collect that if you'd like, um, and then view and save the values that it's calculated. Of course, these are, are meaningless because I've, uh, <laughs> I've done this just uh, on the fly with background, um, and then save it, and it will put that into your, uh, your CLR library. Um, if you wanted to do point dose measurements, you can also do that here. Um, let me scale this down a little. Yeah, that didn't work so well. Um, you can zero from here or you can zero on the device itself. Um, takes it just a moment. And of course, it shows you raw values as well as corrected values. Um, you can set your, your settings for, again, timed trigger continuous measurements. You can set your trigger levels if you want. Um, start some measurements here. Um, and it will give you raw data and, um, and corrected data. Oops, I think I messed it up because I wanted my, it wasn't, OK. That's fine. Um, after you've made several measurements, you can, oh, or just one, doesn't matter. You can either copy the data to clipboard and paste it into um, Excel or your favorite uh, spreadsheet program, um, or you can download the data and it downloads just as a CSV file um, 
to your downloads folder and you have your data that way as well. Um, so that's what I had um, for the MaxSD, um, just to show you what that's like. Um, if you ha want more information about our scintillators, please visit our website. There's some uh, resources there or contact your representative at sales at standardimaging.com. Um, we're happy to talk with you about it. We're happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have. Um, and I'd like to thank you also for your, um, your attention today. If you have questions, please uh, head over to that um, question dialog on GoToMeeting. Um, and I see there are a few that have been entered, so I'll start going through those. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Let's see, is it possible to continuously record green and blue channel readings as a function of time? Um, not currently, that would be an interesting uh, feature to add into it. Um, I would have to look into it. I know during development, we had a logging function that we could log um, log the readings over time. So that, that actually may still be present. I would have to talk with um, my engineer and see if there's a way for a user to get to that. Um, the question is the CLR factor method of CLR calibration bracket with a six by six field size sufficient to do output factors all the way down to a one by one centimeter field. Yes, that should be fine. Um, and the bracket that we send with the um, the W2 was designed, um, it, it fits within, it fully fits within a 10 by 10 field. Um, but if you're doing measurements on a cyber knife, which is usually where that six by six field limit um, happens, um, it's the fiber is wrapped around so that the the I don't have a picture of it here um, that it passes close to the tip of the scintillator so that even if you don't catch the full loop um, you catch more of the fiber in the field in order to make a um, your CLR measurements that way. There's also a method um, if you're on a linear accelerator or um, a cyber knife with MLC. Um, you can actually put it in um, just in uh, there's a, an acrylic sleeve that we send with it um, to that's basically a stem adapter so that it fits in your um, your scanning water tank. You can set it up like you're getting ready to scan and you can use um, a long rectangular field like a, a two by ten or a one by ten um, rectangular field to do and then do a collimator rotation of 90 degrees. Um, in order to do that minimum and maximum figure uh, configuration um, without having to go in and, and loop the fiber around. Let's see, next question is, is there any performance difference between the W2 one by one and one by three? Yes, the one by three gives a, a three times bigger signal. Um, and so um, it's, it's good for, um, scanning, if you're not scanning the extremely small fields where that uh, volume averaging over the three millimeter length is going to be a problem, um, it also will give you better measurements at the um, uh, when you start to get out of the small field range and into to more um, standard field sizes. With the one by one detector, um, if you're going above, say, a 10 by 10 field, um, you're now generating enough Cherenkov um, that it's it starts to swamp your scintillation signal. And so the uncertainty in that Cherenkov correction starts to get a little bit higher um, once you get uh, to, to those larger fields. What's the lifetime of the detector? Um, generally, we see um, about 2% or decrease in signal for every um, thousand gray that are given to the detector. Um, and we recommend that you replace your fiber once the signal decreases uh, below 75 or 80% of its original signal strength. Um, so that gets you, uh, what is that, 10,000 gray, something like that, 10 to 15,000 gray um, for a lifetime of the, the fiber. Um, guidance on how often a recalibration is needed. Um, that's really dependent mostly on, on the doses that you're giving to it. 
Um, if you're doing a lot of really high dose measurements, then you'll want to check your dose calibration um, or your CLR calibration a little bit uh, more regularly. Um, but if you're only using it uh, for, for occasional measurements here and there, then, then again, probably that 2% um, per kilogray is, is going to be your guide. Um, if you give it, if you give it a thousand gray, you probably want to, to recalibrate. Um, the next question, will the CLR factor method of the CLR calibration bracket with a 6 by 6 field work up to a 10 by 10 Yes. Yes, it does. That's fine. Um, and then if I own a W1 and a W2, can I do the minimum and maximum uh, irradiation with the... Um, W1 calibration slab. Yes, you can. You can certainly do use the W2 in that calibration slab. Um, near, need for periodic calibration. Both the CLR and the dose need to be recalibrated occasionally. Um, again, the CLR correction is de uh, is um, depending on um, a stable um, spectrum that's being um, produced by the, well, that's being transmitted down the fiber. And as that fiber ages, um, it attenuates the spectrum a little bit differently because of the discoloration of that optical fiber. So both the CLR factor and the dose calibration will need to be redone um, periodically. Um, the CLR probably will change a little bit more slowly than the dose calibration, but I'm not sure that anyone has really done a good long, a uh, long-term high dose study of that. Um, KQ implies use of the simulator for TG51. Um, the KQ correction um, you can't use it for directly for TG51 because it's not a calibratable detector that you could send in. Um, but if you look at the TRS-483 publication, um, there are additional corrections that need to be applied as you are doing measurements in very small fields. And it's due to change in the energy spectrum of your beam um, due to source occlusion and, um, and other small field factors. And so there are additional KQ values that are intended to be applied to those small field measurements um, because your beam quality is changing. And so there, there are tables within TRS-43 that address both the calibratable uh, detectors like ion chambers but also relative detectors like um, diodes, the diamond detector, and of course the simulator. And so that's that's the KQ value that I'm referring to. Um, water tank only has a single voltage possible. If I want to apply a voltage to the reference chamber, can the W2 handle a voltage? Um, we did put in safeties to bypass that, um, but I would recommend um, either scanning without a reference chamber. Um, you do have to scan slowly with the, the W2 um, because it's a low signal detector. Um, we recommend you do at least one second dwells at each of the measurement points. Um, I have scanned with no reference detector and it does work um, with that. Otherwise, you could potentially use a diode as your reference detector um, so you don't have to apply bias to either one. Um, flash dose rates, I have no idea. I would love to get into a research project uh, to look, in, look at the flash dose rates. Um, I'm not sure um, that we have a good idea at this point about uh, the saturation of the detector. At what point do we saturate um, or can it, can it handle flash dose rates? I'm not sure. We've only, and when I talk about dose rate independence, um, that would be up to your highest FFF field. Um, currently from a standard linear accelerator. Um, flash is pretty exciting though. I'd, I'd love to get into a research project for that. Um, that's the end of the questions. Oh, no, it's not. Hang on. There's another one. Um, 
parallel versus perpendicular orientation for output factor measurements. I would re highly recommend um, that your scintillator be oriented perpendicular to the, the beam axis. And the reason for that um, is twofold, actually. One, you're creating less uh, Cherenkov, and so um, it's easier to correct that. Um, there's a higher higher certainty in that correction. The second reason is actually having to do with the mechanism um, of the Cherenkov production. Cherenkov has a, a preferential production angle of 45 degrees. Um, and because we're relying on total internal reflection down the, the uh, light pipe, the, the fiber optic there, um, more Cherenkov produced also in alignment with the direction of the fiber means a, sig a significantly higher amount of Cherenkov is collected. Um, there's also um, kind of conflicting opinions on the um, whether or not that can change the spectrum that's detected um, by our optics. Um, we've had some people have some difficulty with the, or, or see stronger differences between parallel and perpendicular orientation. Um, and then we'll get their fiber in house and we can't reproduce it. So it, it seems to be somewhat user dependent there. I don't know, um, I have the feeling it depends a little bit on curvature of the fiber within the field. Um, but it's a much more reproducible setup um, across users of various levels of experience, um, in particular, if you stick with that perpendicular or orientation. Um, yes, there's a question, have any institutions used it for small field dosimetry? Yes, a lot have. Um, there, um, I don't know how many are in the field right now, um, but there are a lot of these devices in the field. Um, there are several publications about them, um, and I'm sure anybody who's using it would be happy, happy to uh, um, talk to you about their experience if you, you ask some of your friends if they have one. Um, why did I present raw data? Um, I wanted to show you the interface um, just to show you what the um, how easy it is to use the device. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have an accelerator here that I can I can show you the the measurements from. Um, how do you use the W2 to scan a small field? Um, you would want to set up a scan in your water tank um, that has is a, a step. Um, scan, not a continuous scan, um, although you could do continuous if you go to the slowest speed possible. Uh, I don't recommend it, um, but you can. Um, set it so that it would move to the position, um, take a measurement for at least one second, and then move to the next position. Um, when you set up the W2 in your water tank, um, you would set it up um, using that stem adapter that we send you so that you can um, put it in the um, your chamber holder with your tank. Um, you would hook that fiber then into the W or the max SD and you want that set at least a meter away from the beam um, because the optics are a little bit radio sensitive. Um, you'll get a little more scatter signal um, noise signal if it's too close to the field. Um, and then you connect a triax cable from the back of the Max SD to the um, input of your water tank electrometer. Um, and you can set up the detector as if it's a diode if you want to. Um, select the low range of your electrometer if you can select a range. Um, I know some, some tanks don't allow you to, but if, if it has a, a range, set, select the low range. Um, and then you should be able to collect the data uh, with your water tank. Um, the Max SD will display on the front of it um, which of the CLR library files is being applied. So you don't have to have the Ethernet cable plugged in in order to scan with it as long as you've done your characterization measurements first. Um, and you can select a different one if it turns out you've got the your one by three showing and you want to use your one by one uh, saved library file, you can you can select that too. Um, does this do away with chamber shifts? Yes, it does because it's completely water equivalent. So the center of the detector is the effective point of measurement. Um, 
when will the webinar be available for viewing um, within the next day or two that should be sent to your email inbox um, is a daisy chain needed output factors are compared against a 10 by 10 um, you should be fine at 10 by 10 i would not go bigger than that for daisy chaining um, you can always check at a, a six by six or a five by five if you want to um, but i think 10 by 10 is sufficient i think that's what most people are using um, how do the values from the analog readout relate to those displayed in the web interface um, we do provide um it's sorry i could read the rest of this um, manual warns that the analog readout, readout might overflow. Um, also, the interface ramps up slowly while the analog readout changes very quickly. So the um, we apply a gain factor to the output um, in order to get these signals into the range that is a little more reasonable for your water tank to be measuring. Um, we've got some very sensitive electronics in the Max SD um, in order to handle these small uh, small signals. Um, there's a buffer in the display of the Max SD, um, which is why the ramp up looks slow on the readout, um, but the raw data are what's being used to transmit that signal out to your water tank um, with a 20 millisecond frequency. So that, that um, raw data will not have the same slow ramp up that the display on the max sd does um, but what's being collected as you're doing a charge reading um, is the the true active charge there it's not um, not that delay um, thank you ken i will reach out um, let's see minimum time for acquisitions when beam scanning um, there, we are outputting every 20 milliseconds. Um, if you can do a delay of 20 milliseconds before you do your one second measurement, that's even better. Um, but the, it really is just that um, 20 millisecond delay. Have we tested W2 in VMAT and IMRT beams? Yes, it has been used in VMAT and IMRT beams. Okay, I think that's really the end of the question list so far. Any more, please answer them. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we are very excited to be able to, uh, to share this detector with you and we are happy to talk about any other questions that you might have.